Hello, everyone. In this lecture podcast, I talk about the international law on state immunity. This, again, is a crucial topic because there are certain activities of a state which can cause damage or uh, have an, a negative impact on peoples of another state or nationals of another state. And there may be an intention to seek uh, redress or grievance, or grievance from the courts of a host state. Uh, it can also uh, raise questions about uh, whether or not it is possible to sue or even cause to be arrested the state officials of another state who may be responsible for uh, violations of a particular state's laws. Let's give you a few examples. You will recall that uh, about two years ago, there was an allegation that the Russian government was responsible for shooting down the, uh, the, a jetliner that was passing over Ukraine. That raises a question. Assuming that could actually be established, because evidence seems to point to the Russian government as having been responsible for uh, shooting down that particular jetliner, uh, would it be possible, for example, for the nationals of um, any of those individuals who perished uh, in that jetliner to sue the Russian government in their respective courts? That's one question that we should ask. You will also remember that in the Locker P bombing, uh, this involved the, uh, a, um, a British Airways flight that uh, traveled across Europe, and there was a bomb that had been uh, planted in the, air, in the airplane, and that jetliner uh, exploded in the air as a result of a bomb that had been planted by uh, operatives of the Libyan government. The question that would have to be raised is, would it be possible to sue? Uh, the Libyan government in the courts of um, a, a state, assuming that there are in fact uh, certain assets that might be available in that state. So for example, if Libya might have assets in the US, would uh, US nationals or the representative or the heirs of uh, some of the nationals who perished in the Locker B bombing, would, they have been, uh, would it have been possible for them to sue the Libyan government? We can also ask a question, um, in relation, for example, to uh, what can ha often happen uh, in Malaysia and Singapore, at a particular time, what happens is that in Indonesia, they are involved, I think, in uh, the, the burning of certain forests in order to either clear uh, certain areas or perhaps to you know, cut down certain trees. But in the course of doing that, uh, there is a huge uh, trail of... Uh, heavy smog or smoke that moves all the way to um, Singapore and even Malaysia. And let's assume that as a result, you know, there are certain deaths and uh, there might be uh, injuries and uh, that, you know, certain companies may fail as a result of that. The question then is, uh, would it be possible to sue the Indonesian government, for example, for, for uh, you know, uh, but, um, destroying the environment or, uh, committing acts that uh, destroy the environment. And in that particular case, would it actually be possible for, in, in, uh, for Indonesia to uh, claim state immunity? Another aspect in relation to uh, immunity of states might be that, you know, let's assume that a, a, a foreign state uh, has uh, broadcast libelous and derogatory information against uh, the nationals or even, the, or even a company of a foreign state, which leads to the losses amounting to millions or even billions of dollars against, against a, uh, a company. So let's say you have a company in the United States, and let's assume that there is a, you know, it might be that the Russian government or the Turkish government attack uh, that particular U.S. company, and as a result, that U.S. company suffers losses. Would it be possible for the U.S. company, therefore, to sue, uh, you know, Turkey, uh, the Turkish government or the Russian government for, for causing losses to it if that losses are compensable under U.S. laws. Now, in, in another instance, we can also ask, uh, let's assume that um, there is a private company that uh, has entered into a, a sale contract with a foreign government, uh, let's say for the supply of boots or for the supply of computer systems or even for the supply of, uh, of uh, parts and so on, or even medicines. And let's assume that that foreign state decides or reneges on its obligation to pay. The question then is, can 
uh, the company that supplied the foreign state sue that foreign government. So that's one aspect of uh, the principle of state immunity that, that we will be examining. The other aspect uh, pertains to um, you know, the immunity of the officials of a state. Because obviously when you speak of a state, especially uh, the government of a state, a state can only operate and act on the basis of government officials, of individuals, of persons. And the question therefore that arises is that let's assume that you know, you have certain um, officers of a particular state that have been responsible for the deaths and tortures of the nationals of another state. So let's assume that you have individuals from, uh, you know, from, let's say, Australia, and they go to, uh, they probably go to Myanmar. But in doing so, when they went to Myanmar, they ended up, you know, saying bad things uh, against uh, the Myanmar government. And uh, as a result, the, the Myanmar government, you know, may have killed these Australians and uh, they were tortured by certain Myanmar uh, government officials. And let's assume that these Myanmar government officials at some point went to Australia. And let's assume, therefore, that what the Myanmar military officials uh, did were uh, violations of international criminal law and would also, be, would also violate uh, the laws of Australia. The question then is, if these Myanmar military officials went to Australia, maybe on a private visit, and there is clear evidence that they were responsible for the deaths of uh, Australian nationals while, you know, who went to Myanmar, and these deaths are, uh, are punishable under Australian law, can uh, Australian courts exercise jurisdiction over these Myanmar officials? Okay, now another question we may ask is, uh, what would happen if, um, you know, you have the ambassador of a, of a state, let's assume maybe the ambassador of uh, China, and let's assume that out of anger, the ambassador of China uh, ends up, uh, you know, shooting somebody on the streets of, um, of maybe Sydney. Uh, the question then is, uh, would, would the police uh, in Australia or the courts of Australia have the jurisdiction to uh, to arrest, for example, uh, the Chinese ambassador and to put him to trial uh, in, in Australian courts. And as we examine the principle of state immunity, we realize that the answer to the questions that I've raised are not really that easy to answer. And uh, I hope that as we examine the questions that I raised earlier, we begin to ponder more about the implications of the principle of state immunity. And so after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the customary law of state immunity, who are entitled to claim immunity, and Australia's approach to state immunity. We begin uh, our deeper examination of the, of the international law in immunity by trying to have a refresher about the principle of jurisdiction. We recall uh, in our discussion of jurisdiction last week, that one of the essential attributes of a state is uh, the attribute of sovereignty. And what this means is that uh, when, when a, that what this means is that the state exercises supreme and sovereign power over all persons and subjects within its territory. And, you know, it can pass laws however it likes. And there is no, uh, no, no court in the world, no state government that can question the laws that would be passed by that state because of the principle of sovereignty. So, for example, uh, if, uh, if China feels that uh, eating, for example, of, uh, of, of, um, of fried chicken or maybe the eating of bubble gum is punishable by death, it's perfectly within the power of uh, China to do that. Uh, if Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, feels that uh, women who drive cars uh, should be publicly hung, again, there is no recourse anywhere in the world because that is part of the principle of sovereignty. Saudi Arabia can do what it likes. Except that, of course, uh, if you know, certain uh, acts of the state would amount to, international, uh, to violations of international criminal law, such as when it amounts to perhaps genocide or crimes against humanity, or perhaps um, 
international war crimes. But assuming that, that these activities of a state fall short of being uh, international, uh, violations of international criminal law, then it is within the power of the state to pass any law that it likes within its territory. And this was clearly uh, pointed out by Lord Macmillan uh, when he described the concept of jurisdiction in the case of Compania Naviera Vascongado versus Steamship Cristina, a 1938 case, where he said that it is an essential tribute to the sovereignty of this realm, as of all sovereign independent states, that it should possess jurisdiction over all persons and things within its territorial limits. Now, of course, we know that when it comes to uh, state sovereignty, the jurisdiction of a state actually reaches beyond the territory of a state, such that, for example, Australia can have the power to pass a law that uh, would criminalize behavior committed by uh, Australian nationals abroad. So um, it can uh, penalize, for example, uh, pedophilia committed by Australian nationals abroad. It can also penalize uh, the involvement of Australian nationals uh, in conflicts in Syria, again, as part of uh, the, the broad jurisdiction of a state following the principle of sovereignty. And we already discussed um, in last week's uh, topic that there are three types of state jurisdiction. One, the first, of course, is legislative or, or prescriptive jurisdiction. And this, this refers to the power of a state to make laws that applies to all persons and things within its territory and actually beyond. Okay, so it's not just within his territory, but also outside of his territory, within and outside his territory. And we will examine the uh, related the principles uh, that are related to this, because uh, by applying the principle, for example, of nationality, or the, applying the universality principle, which uh, defines certain crimes to be crimes against humanity, it is actually possible for a state to uh, penalize behavior committed not by even by its own non-nationals uh, abroad. Um, you will also notice, as we see later on, that uh, there's also the, uh, the passive personality principle that where, uh, whereby a state may feel that uh, as a way of uh, protecting its own nationals, it can uh, criminalize uh, the behavior committed by certain individuals even outside of its own territory. Now, another aspect of jurisdiction, and when we speak of state jurisdiction, just as a reminder, we are speaking here uh, more broadly than the jurisdiction that we would typically understand when we examine civil procedure, where uh, jurisdiction typically refers to judicial or adjudicatory jurisdiction or the power of a state or, or the power of a state's courts to try anyone within, within its territory for violating the law. Um, so that's judicial jurisdiction. But, that's, but state, judicial jurisdiction is only an aspect of state jurisdiction in international law. So we talked about legislative jurisdiction. We've now talked about judicial jurisdiction. The other aspect of state jurisdiction refers to administrative or enforcement jurisdiction, which refers to the power of the state to enforce its laws against all persons who contravene them within its own territory. Now, Obviously, when we speak of enforcement jurisdiction, the power of a state to enforce its laws can only be applied within its territory. It cannot reach uh, beyond its territorial limits because to do so might contravene the sovereignty and territorial integrity of another state, which will be a breach of uh, international law. Now, uh, we have said that um, in, in the, the, the past, um, in the past week, that um, the jurisdiction of a state uh, are, is, is founded on five principles, namely territoriality, nationality, the protective principle, universality, and passive personality principle. So for example, by the fact alone that something is committed within the territory of a, territory of a state, the state has full jurisdiction over all persons and things and events that happen within its territory. So that's under the territorial, territoriality principle. But the jurisdiction of a state can also have extraterritorial extra reach. And this could be based on the nationality principle. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Australia can penalize pedophilia, committed or even bestiality uh, abroad. It can also penalize um, you know, the involvement, as I said, of Australian nationals uh, in the war in Syria and so on. So that's based on the nationality principle. 
The protective principle, as we recall, means that in order to protect state interests, it can penalize certain behavior, even though they are committed abroad by non-nationals. So for example, um, if there are certain nationals which uh, will try to uh, you know, ruin the reputation of Australia uh, or try to uh, destroy the economic uh, interests of Australia, Australia has the right on the basis of its protective or the, or the protective principle to criminalize that behavior, even if the activities may happen abroad and even if they may be committed by non-nationals of Australia. So the principle of nationality was because of the virtue of the fact that, you know, it's committed by nationals when it comes to protective principle, it is a result of the need of a state to protect itself. Now, I also mentioned already the universality principle that there are certain uh, acts that uh, violate the norms of uh, the world community. Uh, this could be acts of genocide or crimes against humanity. And in relation, therefore, to these particular acts, uh, which are, you know, which violate certain peremptory norms of international law or use cogence norms, what this means is that uh, it is within the interest of the state or it is within the power of any state in the entire world to be able to punish the commission of uh, certain acts such as genocide or uh, crimes against humanity or war, international war crimes or uh, even piracy or even the traffic of women and children. So these are uh, covered, these particular crimes are covered by, or even slavery, these particular crimes are covered by uh, the, the universality principle in international law. The fifth uh, basis for the exercise by a state of uh, its jurisdiction uh, is based on the passive personality principle in international law, so that by the desire, for example, of a state to try to protect its own nationals when these nationals may be abroad, it may decide to uh, assert this jurisdiction uh, over uh, you know, foreign nationals abroad. So let's say uh, if you have a, an American soldier or you have an American diplomat who may be assassinated uh, in some foreign state, the United States government or you know, a state may say that uh, such killings uh, will be subject to the laws of, um, you know, of, of a whole state or, or, or the state of a forum. So these are the jurisdictional principles as a, a way of reminder. Now, what we therefore uh, now can see is that because of the principles of uh, state immunity, the principles of state immunity uh, act as a derogation of uh, the principles of state jurisdiction. Because as we recall, as we said, the rule is that a state, uh, be, 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 the rule is that because of the principle of state sovereignty, the state has jurisdiction over all persons and things and events that occur within, within its territory. But there is also another uh, principle of international law, uh, a customary international law rule pertaining to sovereign immunity. And um, for example, in the case of uh, jurisdictional immunities of the state, the case of Germany versus Italy, Greece intervening, a, de a decision made by the International Court of Justice, and I shall speak more about this uh, sometime in the lecture podcast. It ruled that you know state immunity uh, as a, the rule that the state is immune from the jurisdiction of another state is recognized as a general rule of customary international law, solidly rooted in the current practice of states. In the case of uh, De Haver versus Queen of Portugal, a, a case decided uh, in the Queen's Bench in the UK, Lord Campbell also cautioned that to cite a foreign potentate in a municipal court is contrary to the law of nations and an insult which he is entitled to resent. So the idea, therefore, of state immunity as a customary rule of international law uh, has long been recognized in international law as far back as the 1800s. And what this essentially means, a uh, meant was that uh, as a matter of international law, uh, it was impermissible, for example, for, for, a, a, for one state to try to uh, arrest for example, the heads of state of another because of the principle of, um, of, of, of state immunity. Now, the rule, therefore, uh, of uh, state immunity is a derogation or a diminution of another universally recognized international law principle of territorial sovereignty, uh, as I mentioned, which recognizes the full competence of a state over all activities, persons, 
events and property within its own territory. So that if a state persists in exercising jurisdiction against another state, against its will, despite you know, the, the assertion by a particular state of its right to state immunity, a state that, that, that persists in exercising jurisdiction would be in breach of international law. Now, I wish to point out that the principle of state immunity is actually a procedural in character, and I would explain why it is procedural in character right now, or maybe in a short while. It actually does not address the question of state culpability. So, for example, in the case of jurisdictional immunities of the state, Germany versus Italy, Grace versus intervening, uh, the ICJ said that the rules of state immunity are procedural in character and are confined to determining whether or not the courts of one state may exercise jurisdiction in respect of another state. They do not bear upon the question of whether or not the conduct in respect of which the proceedings are brought was lawful or unlawful. I raised the question of whether or not it is procedural in character or substantial in character because earlier on, I had said that it is possible for one state to commit uh, acts that you know, uh, impair the so sovereignty of another state. So it could be uh, Iraq uh, when, it tried, when it invaded Kuwait. And the question would have been, uh, in doing so, uh, would it have been possible for the courts of Kuwait to, uh, you know, to seize the foreign assets owned by the Iraqi government that were located in Kuwait as a result of the violations of norms of international law by Iraq when it invaded Kuwait. That's a very clear example. Um, or it could be like, uh, as a result of the Second World War, uh, we know that uh, Nazi Germany was responsible for the genocide or the killing of millions of uh, Jews in World War II. And let's assume that the heirs of of these uh, Jews who were victims of genocide, or even the survivors themselves, then sought, uh, tried to seek compensation from the German government uh, in, in, some, in, in the state where they live. The question is, could, there, could the courts of that state try to uh, assert this jurisdiction over the German government? Now, what we know, what we will know as I explain later on, is that the courts of a foreign state will we will state and we'll have to state under principles of international law that it does not have any jurisdiction over a foreign state. So even in the case of Kuwait, a Kuwaiti court will not have any jurisdiction over the acts of the Iraqi government, even if they were unlawful and illegal under international law. The question therefore that arises, or let's say, you know, in the case of Nazi Germany committing uh, genocide, the question therefore that arises is, does it mean that because a state seems to have immunity uh, from suit or from the jurisdiction of a foreign court. Does it mean that a state is therefore, is therefore uh, you know, can, can, uh, can undertake uh, acts with impunity because you know, foreign courts don't have jurisdiction anyway? We're going to go back to that towards the end of uh, this tutorial or this, this end, end of this lecture podcast, which I think is covered by uh, number 19. Uh, the, um, the, the PowerPoint slide in num number 19. So we're going to go back to that. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so what is the basis for the principle of state immunity, which we know is a rule of customary international law? So one way of putting it is that the principle of state immunity is said to rest on the principle of sovereign equality which is recognized in Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the United Nations Charter, which provides that the United Nations is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all of its members. So if all of, its member, if all, if all of the members are sovereign and they are equal, then it shouldn't be possible for one state to try to put another state within its jurisdiction because they're all sovereign equals. Because if a state... Uh, can exercise jurisdiction over another state, it will have to mean that that other state is, sovereign, uh, is, is subordinate to it. But that would violate the principle of sovereign equality. Now, the other uh, way by which uh, state immunity can, can be said to, uh, to be uh, legally permissible in international law is the principle of par in parem non abet imperium. Uh, again, this is corollary to the principle of sovereign equality because what it essentially means is that one cannot exercise 
authority over one's equal. So in the case of Playa Larga, uh, the case of owners of cargo uh, lately laden on board, or versus one Congress, Congreso del Despartido, a case decided by the House of Lords in the UK, Lord Wilberforce uh, expounded on this dictum. It, it is necessary to start from first principle, the basis upon which one state is considered to be immune from a territorial jurisdiction of the courts of another state is that of par in parent, which effectively means that the sovereign or governmental act of one state are not matters upon which the courts of other states will adjudicate. So state immunity, therefore, is a rule of uh, customary international law. However, there are two theories uh, of uh, customary international law concerning state immunity. One is absolute state immunity. The other one is restrictive state immunity, which we discussed in a short while. Uh, when it comes, for example, to the theory of absolute state immunity, uh, the assertion uh, mainly was that you know, all, acts of a, of a, all acts of a state, whether they are sovereign acts or, or whether they are private or commercial acts, uh, are covered with the principle of state immunity so that they will never be subject to the jurisdiction of another state. Whereas if you talk about, so here, so uh, acts, so j just to clarify, in, under the principle of restrictive state immunity, uh, acts, your impunity or sovereign acts are, uh, you know, immune, whereas Acts yuri uh, gestionis or acts of private or of a private or commercial character are not immune. So let's uh, first talk about uh, the, the principle of absolute state immunity. So the principle of absolute state immunity, uh, as I said, means that any actions uh, that any state, for example, under the principle of absolute state immunity, a state can never be subject to the jurisdiction of the courts of another state. So whatever acts that a state may do, whether these acts are uh, in sovereign in nature or commercial, they can never be uh, the subject of the jurisdiction of a foreign state. We will be clear about the distinction between you know, commercial acts and sovereign acts. Uh, in a short while. But maybe just to give you an example, what exactly is a, is, is a public act or a sovereign act? So for example, when a state tries to um, engage in the act of war or invades another country, uh, this would clearly be a, a sovereign act. Um, when a state, for example, may, may try to, um, uh, you know, uh, do, do things in order to interdict or, uh, or stop uh, both refugees. This clearly is a sovereign act. But there are certain acts also committed by state government, uh, which are commercial in nature, such as when it enters into private contracts for the supply of private goods. It could be for the supply of medicines. It could be for the supply of computers. In these cases, these are of a commercial character. So, but when it, but in the past, when he spoke, uh, but in the past, uh, because states in the past adhered to the principle of absolute state immunity, uh, you know, in international law, no, no distinction was drawn between acts iuri imperi and acts iuri gestionis. So under the principle of state immunity, which was there uh, up to around 1952, the acts of a state, whether the acts were sovereign acts or commercial acts or acts juridicionis, meant that, that a state can never be subject to the jurisdiction uh, of another state. So, for example, in the Schooner Exchange versus McFadden, a case decided in the United States, uh, it said that state immunity applies to all ships held and used by a government for a public purpose. And that when, for the purpose of advancing the trade of its people or providing revenue for its treasury, a government acquires, mans, and operates ships in the carrying of the trade, they are public ships in the sense that warships, warships are. So in this particular case, even if these ships were actually engaged in, uh, in a commercial activity, uh, they were deemed to, uh, um, you know, th these ships, because they were undertaking 
uh, because of the principle of absolute state immunity, they were they, they were uh, you know exempt from the or they were immune from the jurisdiction of another state. In the Parliament Belge, uh, it was also decided by, that trading on the part of a sovereign does not subject him to any liability to the jurisdiction of another court. In Porto Alexander. Uh, the UK Court of Appeal held that even though Portugal's state-owned vessel had been engaged in a purely commercial activity, a claim of sovereign immunity could still be raised. In the case of Berizzi Brothers Company versus the Pesaro, a case decided in the United States in 1926, the, U the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Italian government succeeded in its claim of immunity from suit over the operations of its ship, ship the Pesaro, which was used for trade, particularly in delivering merchandise, artificial silk, from Italy to New York. Now think about that for the moment. What is the significance of um, state absolute state immunity? Can you imagine if you are a, a, you know, a private company that deals with a foreign government and you are trying to uh, enter into a contract, commercial contract with a, with a foreign government or with a foreign state? It could be for the supply of goods or for the supply of services. And because of the principle of absolute state immunity, what if the state, that foreign government or the foreign state decides not to pay you for uh, under the contract? It would mean that you have no recourse. You cannot sue that foreign state in your, uh, in your, in, in, in your forum uh, court, mainly because of the principle of absolute state immunity. So it had the, the significance of uh, the absolute principle of absolute state immunity is that it could have a detrimental effect upon international commerce. And so uh, the significance mainly was that as a rule, as a result of the rule of absolute immunity, many commercial activities in which foreign states were involved were free from the legal processes of municipal courts. And so therefore, uh, in 1984, for example, the, the Australian Law Reform Commission observed that the foreign state party had the option of litigating itself if the chances of success were high, but if they were not, of hiding behind the shield of immunity. So if you had a private company, uh, Australian private company, dealing with a foreign state, the foreign state can you know, sue that foreign, uh, the, the private, Australian private company if it felt that there was a breach of contract or that the foreign government, the foreign state, uh, suffered damage, but the Australian private company had no recourse. It couldn't sue. The, the foreign state in return. So there was that anomaly that was observed by the Australian Law Reform Commission. In the United States as well, it was, no, which we know, uh, embraced the theory of absolute state immunity as noted in at least two cases, the McFadden case, uh, as well as uh, the Britzi case. Uh, the United States found itself increasingly subject to the jurisdiction of, of, of foreign courts under a restrictive theory of immunity even though United States courts continued to recognize the absolute uh, immunity principle of uh, the same foreign state. So what had happened was, whilst the United States continued to abide by the principle of absolute state immunity, thinking that it was a, a customary law, uh, it was a, a rule of customary international law, there were, uh, in fact, some states that had, tr had, that had begun to make a clear distinction between acts, your imperium, or sovereign acts, as opposed to uh, acts eurigestionis, or acts of a commercial character. And so that for some of these states, when the, act, the activities or the acts of a foreign state uh, were in the nature of commercial transactions, then the, the courts of these foreign states began to exercise jurisdiction over these foreign states. And so therefore, there was a rethinking even in the U.S. as a result of this, the change uh, concerning the principle of state immunity from absolute to restrictive state immunity. And it, it, it began to be felt in the United States that if the United States continued to adopt the principle of uh, absolute uh, state immunity, and given the fact that you know, uh, United States uh, business interests abroad were beginning to grow, uh, there, it was then detrimental to, uh, to uh, United States companies because uh, 
it, it would have meant that um, while on the one hand they would recognize that you know a, a foreign a foreign state that engages in commercial activities with a U.S. company were, uh, couldn't be the subject of jurisdiction of U.S. courts. The uh, the the a, an American company that deals with a foreign state no did not, however, have the the power to uh, you know try to seek jurisdiction over you know foreign state within uh, within the U.S. So. The United States, therefore, in 1952, decided to change its position on the subject of foreign state immunity, which culminated in the letter, uh, in the Tate letter to the U.S. Attorney General. Uh, the Tate letter represented the, uh, the, the decisions of the United States Trade Department as well as the U.S. State Department, and where it said uh, that there should be a shift uh, from absolute, the, the theory of absolute state immunity to restrictive state immunity. And that the Tate letter was eventually accepted as part of U.S. jurisprudence in 1976. So, for example, in Alfred Dunhill of London Incorporated versus Republic of Cuba, the U.S. Supreme Court said that in 1952, as evidenced by the Tate letter, the United States abandoned the absolute theory of sovereign immunity and embraced the restrictive view under which immunity in our courts should be granted only with respect to causes of action arising out of a foreign state's public or governmental actions, and not with respect to those arising out of its commercial or proprietary actions. The principle of uh, restrictive state immunity was also uh, enunciated uh, in the case of uh, the owners of the ship Philippine Admiral, Philippine flag versus Wallam shipping, or the Philippine Admiral's case, where the Privy Council considered that the restrictive theory of state immunity is more cons consonant with justice. In the UK, the UK Court of Appeal also decided in 1977 in the case of Trend Text Trading Corporation versus Central Bank of Nigeria that um, this doctrine gives immunity to acts of a government, governmental nature described in Latin as Yuri Imperi, but no immunity to acts of a commercial nature or Yuri Justionis. So, what was clear was that the principle of uh, absolute state immunity was being abandoned by, by all states. And so, for example, uh, in, in 1978, not only was the principle of uh, restrictive state immunity part of the UK law in the form of a common law or decisions made by the UK courts, but the UK Parliament itself enacted the State Immunity Act 1978, uh, which, which codified the restrictive theory of state immunity, so that the restrictive state theory of state immunity became the settled law in the UK. Uh, in Australia, the Foreign State Immunities Act, or the FSIA 1985, also came into force on 1 April 1986, and in Section 9, it provides that, except as provided by or under this act, a foreign state is immune from the jurisdiction of the courts of Australia in a proceeding. However, under Section 11, Paragraph 1 of the S FSIA, it also provides that a foreign state is not immune in a proceeding insofar as the proceeding concerns a commercial transaction. So clearly, therefore, under uh, Australian law as well, the, the principle of restrictive state immunity is now uh, categorically part uh, of settled law in Australia. And under the FSIA, uh, a commercial transaction means a commercial, trading, business, professional, or industrial or like transaction into which the foreign state has entered or a like activity in which the state has engaged and without limiting the general, generality of the foregoing includes a contract for the supply of goods and services, an agreement for a loan or some other transaction for or in respect to the provision of insurance, and a guarantee or indemnity in respect of a financial obligation but does not include a contract of employment or a bill of exchange. The FSIA also provides for other exemptions to the rule of foreign state immunity in a proceeding, insofar as the proceeding concerns, among others, contracts of employment, personal injury and damage to property, ownership, possession, and use of property, copyright, patents, and trademarks, membership of bodies, corporate, arbitrations, actions in REM, bills of exchange, taxes, and related proceedings. So 
uh, what Australia has done is to really clarify uh, what commercial transactions mean or what could be covered under the, under the concept of commercial transactions that would then mean that the principle of state immunity cannot apply. Now, when we examine uh, the principle of state immunity, actually there are three aspects to it. One already is the principle of sovereign immunity, which you know, relates to uh, the activities of a state. Now, uh, I, I, we already clarified that as of the moment, it is the principle of um, restrictive state immunity that is uh, observed as a rule of customary international law. So the, principle, the, the customary international law of um, absolute state immunity has been abandoned. But the question that arises then is that uh, when it comes to sovereign immunity, it, does international law try to make a distinction between sovereign acts of a state which are uh, legal under international law and which are illegal? So that question uh, was actually examined by the International Court of Justice in the case of jurisdictional immunities of the state, Germany versus Italy with Greece inter intervening, because in that particular case, uh, there had been an, an attempt on the part of certain uh, Italians uh, who were either survivors of um, the genocide of World War II or who were heirs of uh, victims of genocide by Nazi Germany during World War II. And they sought uh, compensation from the German government by, by filing suit uh, in Italian courts uh, on the basis that uh, the, the Italian uh, parliament had passed a law that allowed uh, victims of genocide to sue even uh, you know, uh, foreign states. And when the, when the proceedings uh, went on in the foreign courts, in the courts of Italy against uh, the German government, the German government filed a complaint with the International Court of Justice against Italy. The question is, how do you think the, 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 uh, the International Court of Justice ruled? Note that um, the, the question really was that, could state, could state or sovereign immunity be claimed by, uh, by Germany uh, for the acts of genocide, which had caused the deaths and, uh, and you know, severe damage to uh, victims, for example, of Italy, because genocide was clearly unlawful under international law. Do, so, in other words, let me clarify that. Did the, court, the, did the Italian courts have the jurisdiction on the ground that uh, the sovereign acts of uh, Germany were illegal under international law, and therefore, the principle of state immunity could not, could not be raised. The International Court of Justice, however, ruled against uh, Italy, and it ruled that the fact that uh, the acts of Germany uh, were sovereign acts, the acts of genocide were sovereign acts, so they were public acts of the government, it meant that the principle of state or sovereign immunity applied, regardless of whether or not uh, you know, these particular acts were unlawful under international law. Uh, it didn't really matter. What mattered was that uh, these acts were sovereign acts and therefore beyond the jurisdiction of a foreign court. And so that is the ruling uh, in relation to the principle of, of sovereign in, in immunity. And as I said, you begin to wonder whether or not, does it mean therefore that, you know, uh, because of the principle of state uh, immunity, even for acts that are illegal or unlawful under international law, would it mean that you know um, state officers uh, can claim uh, to be uh, to be uh, you know uh, to be exempt from from international law so that they could act with impunity? Uh, this was also uh, quite clear in the case of um, ex parte Pinochet, because in that particular case there had been an attempt on the part of the Spanish government to seek the extradition of Pinochet, who at the time was in the UK, because there was a law uh, in, in Spain which uh, allowed it to punish and seek indemnification uh, against uh, foreign officials or foreign governments uh, for, for acts of torture or tortuous acts against uh, Spanish nationals. Uh, Pinochet, however, uh, tried to 
uh, raise the principle of state immunity in relation to himself so that he should no longer be subject to, uh, to uh, the extradition request on the part of the, of the Spanish government. He was saying that even assuming that as you know, the previous head, at the time he was no longer head of, of, of Chile, but because his acts of you know, causing the torture and deaths of um, hundreds of Spanish nationals were in fact sovereign acts, so they were sovereign or public acts, even if they may have been crimes against international law or violations of international law, it would then mean that he could still uh, assert the principle of state immunity. And the, uh, the UK court ruled that, uh, in fact, uh, the principle of state immunity can, can be applied. So in the case of Ex parte Pinochet, uh, number three, the House of Lords ruled that state immunity probably grew from the historical immunity of the person of the monarch. So in any, in any event, such personal immunity of the head of state persists to the present day. And the head of state is entitled to the same immunity as the state itself. The diplomatic representative of the foreign state and the foreign state is also afforded the same immunity in recognition of the dignity of the state which he represents. So as a result, in the case of Ex parte Pinochet, uh, the, the, the House of Lords uh, ruled that uh, the, the UK court did not have any jurisdiction over Pinochet. So uh, we now know, therefore, that uh, there is that aspect of um, sovereign immunity of the state itself. There's also the immunity of state representatives, which we'll discuss in greater detail. And the third aspect of state immunity is the state immunity of state agencies and instrumentalities. So uh, a state would oftentimes uh, you know, create uh, entities or agencies or instrumentalities to undertake certain functions. Now for as long as these agencies or instrumentalities, uh, which we might consider to be government owned or controlled corporations, for as long as they are undertaking sovereign or public functions, the principle of uh, state immunity uh, will still apply. Now, so we go back to the immunity of state representatives so in the case of uh, arrest warrant of 11, 000, 11 April 2000, the case of the Democratic Republic of the Congo versus Belgium, the International Court, Court of Justice also ruled that uh, the Minister for our Foreign Affairs of Congo, who had been accused of criminal violations of rules of international law, which had the character of his cogents, was still entitled to immunity as a matter of customary, as a matter of customary international law. So the, the, uh, the Congolese Minister of Foreign Affairs had been accused of having committed uh, crimes against humanity, but because at that time uh, he was uh, still the Minister for Foreign Affairs, then uh, the, the International Court of Justice ruled upon the objections of the Congolese government that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, was immune from the jurisdiction of uh, the Belgian court. Now, there is another, uh, there is a, so apart from customary international law, which uh, has been recognized uh, pertaining to the immunity, immunity of state representatives, there are also two uh, conventions which uh, accord immunity of state representatives. The first is the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which entered into force on 24 April 1986, which recognizes the immunity of diplomatic agents. So it provides that under Article 29, that the person of a diplomatic agent shall be inviolable. He shall not be liable to any form of arrest or detention. Now, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations also recognizes the immunity of consular officers and consular employees, but note that under Article 43, Paragraph 1, it provides that consular officers and consular employees shall not be amenable to the jurisdiction of the judicial or administrative authorities of the receiving state in respect of the acts performed in the exercise of consular functions. So there is a proviso here that the diplomatic or the, cons the, the, the immunity of uh, consular uh, officers only apply in respect of acts performed in the exercise of consular functions. So when a consular officer, therefore, uh, commits acts which are not of a consular nature, and you know, violates uh, the laws of a host state, that consular officer 
uh, can no longer claim immunity under the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Contrast this with the Vienna Convention on Di Diplomatic Relations, where the person of a diplomatic agent shall be inviolable. So in, in other words, under no circumstance can a, a, um, a, a diplomat be uh, subject, for example, to arrest or detention. In the case of consular officers, depending on the crime committed in a state and depending on the punishment, such as whether or not it, if the punishment is, for, is of a serious nature or not, if the crime is of a serious nature, uh, there will be no immunity uh, of a consular officer from the jurisdiction of a host state. Now the other, uh, so we mentioned state, uh, state immunity. We also talked about the immunity of state representatives because a state has to act uh, through uh, individuals. There's also immunity of state agencies and instrumentalities. So in the case of Krajina versus Stas Agency in the UK, uh, sovereign immunity was recognized by the UK Court of Appeal as applying to a news agency, which was an organ of the Soviet government. In Bacchus, SRL, SRL versus Servicio Nacional del Trigo, uh, the, uh, the UK Court also ruled that a government organized trading corporation was an organ of the Spanish state and entitled to sovereign immunity even though the corporation possessed a separate legal personality under Spanish law. So the mere fact alone that a, 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 an, an entity may in fact have a legal personality distinct from that of a state will not mean that it sheds uh, its uh, uh, immune character for as long as uh, what it undertakes are acts which are sovereign of a sovereign or a public nature. In Trentex Trading Corporation versus Central Bank of Nigeria, the uh, UK court also confirmed that sovereign immunity applied to an alter ego or organ of a foreign state government. So finally, we go back to the question of does state immunity mean impunity? Because as we said, in the case of the jurisdictional immunities of the state, Germany versus Italy, the International Court of Justice ruled that notwithstanding the fact that Germany had committed uh, you know, serious international uh, serious violations of international crime, criminal law because of, the, of its acts of genocide committed during World War II. Still, uh, Germany uh, couldn't be the subject of suit in, in Italian courts because of the principle of, of state immunity. So for as long, therefore, as the acts of a state were of a sovereign or public character, even if those acts were illegal under international law, or violated use cogent norms over acts involving genocide or crimes against humanity, that particular state still could not be subject to the jurisdiction of a host, to the course of a host state. Which, which, what, which makes us ask, would that mean therefore that as a result of the principle of state immunity for sovereign acts, a state uh, you know, can act with impunity? The answer is, is really no, uh, because, for example, um, if we examine international criminal law under Article 5 of the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court, uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crimes of aggression are all within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And the Rome Statute is quite uh, emphatic and expressed in saying that uh, the rules of state immunity will not apply to government officials who have been responsible or involved in genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. So what it only means is that whilst a, a foreign state, when it undertakes acts of a, of a sovereign character, even if it's illegal because it's genocide or, or involves a crime against humanity, that foreign state can never be under the jurisdiction of a foreign state. That will not be allowed. The jurisdiction of another state or the courts of another state. But that state, however, can be subject to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court for as long as that state is a party to the Rome Statute. Now, if, however, so what it means, therefore, is that the only people or the only states that are bound uh, by the Rome Statute or can be under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court will be the parties to the Rome Statute. 
And we should note that uh, Russia, United States, and China are not parties to the Rome Statute. So, you know, uh, government of officials of these states uh, cannot be the subject of jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. But apart from the, the Rome Statute, uh, we can't really say that um, a state has impunity from, for, for genocide or crimes against humanity or for war crimes or crimes of aggression because uh, the, the United Nations Security Council has a mandate uh, under the United Nations Charter uh, to ensure international peace. So as a result of its powers, which we examine in greater detail in, in week nine pertaining to the topic on uh, international criminal law, the UN Security Council has been able to create international criminal tribunals. And as a result of um, these international criminal tribunals, uh, certain persons who are responsible for the commission of genocide, war crimes, or crimes against humanity have been tried and punished uh, by international criminal tribunals created by the United Nations Security Council. So uh, an international criminal tribunal was created for in relation to the Bosnian Wars in the 1990s, in relation to the, to the war crimes in, in, um, in Rwanda, as well as the war crimes or crimes against humanity in the case of Sierra Leone. Now, what is noteworthy, however, is that if we try to examine uh, the, you know, the exercise of uh, jurisdiction uh, of the international, of an international criminal tribunal over a state on the basis of the decisions of the UN Security Council, what is crucial to remember is that the UN Security Council can only have a binding resolution if it, is, it hasn't been the subject of a veto by any of the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. So among the uh, permanent members of the UN Security Council are the United States, Russia, China, uh, and the UK. And so if any of these states veto a resolution of the UN Security Council, then you cannot have a resolution that, for example, would create uh, international criminal tribunals to, cry, to try uh, government officials of a state that may have committed uh, violations of international criminal law. So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the customary law of state immunity, who are entitled to claim immunity and Australia's approach to state immunity. And so with that, thank you for listening to this podcast. This is Dr. Manjo Oison. I hope you learned and enjoyed uh, listening to this podcast. Bye.